there were all these ideas about hardware and software and information that were just boiling up. And a lot of it was these very intelligent and insightful people beginning to put the pieces together. What was obvious was that what we now call computing, the hardware and software, was not a single idea. It was maybe half a dozen or more ideas that finally got put together in the right way. This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at Luminary FM. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community oriented. Our second season launches with a three part series featuring the preeminent Mitch Waldrop. We discuss the history, ideas, and origins of computing, software, the internet, and of course, the pioneers and unsung heroes who made it all a reality. It's hard to imagine a better place to start exploring the modern notions of change, technology, and software. Mitch is the author of The Dream Machine, a seminal contribution to the history of modern computing and the internet. Mitch was previously an editorial page and features editor at Nature Magazine and has published books on a wide range of topics, including artificial intelligence and complexity. We tried doing justice to the content of the dream machine in one sitting, which quickly expanded into three discrete recording sessions over a handful of weeks. We are forever grateful to Mitch. This first episode touches on Mitch's journey writing The Dream Machine and the period from the 1940s through the 1970s, which includes the philosophy underlying hardware and software, the work of intellectual contributors such as Vannevar Bush, Von Neumann, and Claude Shannon, interactive computing, the ARPANET, World War II as a catalyst for computing, time sharing, JCR Licklider's intergalactic network, ARPA's Woodstock Moment, and the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, also known as PART. Welcome, Dr. Mitchell Waldrop. We would love to start with the seminal book which you've written, The Dream Machine, which explains in great detail history of computing, history of software, what was the motivation behind writing the book? And if you can briefly also talk about the process of writing the book. Well, the motivation initially in 1992 was to seize an opportunity. I had just finished up a previous book. My first major book it was called Complexity. It was about complex adaptive systems, the Santa Fe Institute, and so forth. It was just coming out in the fall of 1992, and I was casting about for my next book project. And I learned that the Sloan Foundation in New York was funding a series of books on technologies of the 20th century. This was to be written by professional writers, addressed to a popular audience, but to understand various technologies. I said, oh, that sounds really interesting. So I talked to them did an application, and they commissioned me to write a book on software. So what about software? Well, that's up to you. 
It could be a biography of a key person. It could be, you know, whatever. The approach is up to you, just this general topic of software. And so long as it's in there, we will, we'll be happy. So this was great. You know, I got a very large check for living expenses and another fund for travel expenses. And I went to work. And my first response was to say, Oh my gosh. I've actually got this. Now I've got to do it. What do I actually say about software that hasn't been said a zillion times before? I remember by then PCs were everywhere. You know, Microsoft was king of the hill. You know, the internet was just starting to show up. You could go to any bookstore. There were still bookstores in those days and you would see long shelves lined with books about software, software packages. And so, so what am I going to write? biography of Bill Gates, it's been done. The soul of a new software package, that seemed kind of derivative. And so I flattered it around. I was talking to everybody I knew in the field and absorbing ideas. I spent two years focusing, I was going to do essentially a biography of one very interesting person who I'd known. He, did, he had just died in 92. His name was Alan Newell. He was an artificial intelligence pioneer, and he had actually been instrumental in a number of you know, key ideas related to software. So I actually spent almost two years pursuing this. I interviewed his wife, his widow, uh, his colleagues, his students, and I began to realize this over time, this would be a good book, but it wasn't quite this book. He was an interesting guy, but it, there were just too many things that got left out if I focused only on him. In the meantime, I'd been hearing from people in the field, uh, people I knew, says, you ought to look at this guy, Licklider. Uh, he was, he was instrumental, but you know, I didn't really fully appreciate any of that. And I had only the vaguest idea of what was going on. I knew he was important. He had been at you know, ARPA and started the community, but he was dead. He had died in 1990. I didn't know anything about him. And what had happened was that I, in 1994, there was a celebration in Boston for the 25th anniversary of the ARPANET. So I went there and talked to people. And since Licklider had been at MIT and at Bolt Brannick and Newman, the company that did a lot of the hardware for the ARPANET, I was talking to a lot of people about him. And I began to realize that here was this guy who was, had been beloved by so many people. Uh, I started getting all these stories about him and the things he had done, you know, the artificial intelligence, the project Mac. He had actually funded Newell and others. And then I realized that his widow was still alive. I called her up. Uh, she lived outside of Boston in a town called Arlington. I called her up and told her I was writing a book and it would mention her husband. And if it was all right, could I come out and talk to her about him? And this frail voice, frail sounding voice, I said, well, I don't know how much I can help you. You know, uh, we didn't talk about his work much. Okay. You know, all right. Fine. So I just uh, said, all right, let's go. And I went out there on an afternoon and I had this big clunky, heavy, they called it a laptop. It was, you know, nothing like today's laptops. So anyway, I, I typed my notes and she turned out to be, Louise was her name, she turned out to be anything but frail. Uh, she was this tall, elegant, fiercely intelligent woman. We sat down and she had a cup of tea and some cookies on the uh, edge of the saucer right next to me. And I unfolded the laptop and she said again, well, I'm not sure how much I can help you. So that's okay. So we started talking. Four hours later, tea is stone cold because I haven't had time. <laughs> uh, I had been typing. I had to call it quits because my fingers wouldn't move anymore. They were so tired. She remembered everything. And he every night he would come home and go over their day and she remembered it all and she was telling stories about you know him growing up and so and i realized and I, I want you to imagine the emotional impact of that moment this, this woman in her 70s was talking about the love of her life mm -hmm. and just spilling it all and it's like she needed to talk i finally had to call it quits and as i was packed up and going out the door she was telling me more stuff, so I had to go out to the car afterwards and scribble it down as fast as I could before I got it. 
Uh, and that was just the first of several interviews I did. But I realized by that point that I had enough to do a book about this guy, dead or not. And I realized I had to tell all the folks I talked to about Newell says, well, you know, he's a great guy, but, you know, <laughs> I've got to change this book. And it was kind of embarrassing, but they all understood. Um, so I wrote the first part of the book, sort of wrote itself. It was, I mean, it took a long time, but Look Lighter had been embedded in this whole area of intellectual ferment around information and computing, you know, cybernetics, all of it at uh, Harvard and MIT. The hard part was finishing uh, the, the, the latter part of the book. I, I talked about the ARPA community that he had created, Xerox Park, but then the latter part of the book where he himself was less instrumental, but I had introduced all these characters and the story was playing out. That actually took me several years to work that out. It hopefully reads seamlessly, I hope, but it was agony because I had all these, now had all these balls in the air that I had to do something with and bringing them down was uh, tricky. So it took a long, long time. The book finally came out in 2001, got great reviews in the New York Times, so forth. And we planned this whole, you know, book tour, six cities, which is pretty good for a science book. And then 9-11 happened. Oh. And so, so the sales are pretty awful, but its interest has continued to percolate. And now it's been republished by Strike Press. And that's and it's started to get attention. It is a fascinating read. I would say it's a masterfully crafted narrative with so much beautiful detail and so cogently formulated these ideas. It is truly a seminal book, like Sachin mentioned initially. Let's talk about what you've captured in the dream machine as it relates to the history of, compu of computing and the internet and software and, of course, hardware as well. So there's sort of a lot to digest, if you will. And one helpful framework might be to break down the entire book into some major phases with respect to time. And within each major phase, talk about the people the main ideas and the kind of the key events of that phase. Maybe first of all, how do you think about breaking down the dream machine into major phases? The phases correspond roughly to the chapters I have in the green dream machine. But the way I think about it, and this was something I arrived at only through the research and you know the writing of it, the way I think about it is that this whole era of the 30s, actually starting in the late 20s, but the 1930s and 1940s were this era of ferment when looking back on it, there were all these ideas about hardware and software and information that were just boiling up. And a lot of it was these very intelligent and insightful people beginning to put the pieces together. And what was obvious looking at the actual history of it, and I, I spent a, a fair amount of time you know, reading the research literature on the history of science, uh, history of technology, history of computing, mm -hmm. but watching people put the pieces together, what was obvious was that what we now call computing, the hardware and software, was not a single idea. It was maybe half a dozen or more ideas that finally got put together in the right way. And also there was a driver, partly intellectual, partly it was with the ideas just maturing, but also there was a need for it. The technology by the 20s was getting to the point where you couldn't do it simply with equations on the back of an envelope or even a desktop calculator. I'm thinking of technologies like the electric power grid, which when you actually have to build the thing and keep it from melting down, you have to, you know, the equations that govern not just the transmission of power, but how the various components interact with each other are these like sixth order differential equations. Nobody could solve them, and there were some fairly 
major disasters as people started building out the electric power network that people couldn't predict. They, they had to build it and then they didn't know what was lurking, just waiting for them. So that was a big driver. And another area was aircraft design. You needed immense amounts of calculation in order to do figure out how this plane was going to perform. You could build them and fly them and see how they worked or they had wind tunnels. But, you know, that led to a lot of wasted effort, not to mention dead pilots. And also, as became apparent during the war, there were things that you never would have thought of, like aiming tables for artillery, which required immense amounts of calculation. You had to take into account the, the temperature and the humidity because that changes the density of the air and, you know, so forth. And this became very important. Anyway, so there are uh, all these technological drivers. It was becoming apparent to everyone that you just needed immense amounts of calculation. So people started trying to build these machines, and you know there were at least half a dozen or more that are still quoted in the history books about early computers. But there were a number of ideas, and I spent an entire chapter just looking at the kinds of ideas that went into what we now call the modern computer. For example... In the 20s and 30s, the best way to calculate complex equations and so forth was to build an analog computer, literally a mechanical model of the system. And the most powerful computer on the planet in those days uh, came online in about 1935 or 6, was created by a dean of engineering, Vannevar Bush at MIT. It was a bunch of rods and cams and gears and pulleys. And you spent two days setting it up, but then you started the motor and the rods would turn and, you know, one would be your input time that would turn at a, a steady rate. And then with all the cams and pulleys and so forth, another would drive a pen, which would plot out the solution to your equation accurate to a, maybe a percent or two. And that was, that was a revolution, but it was an analog machine. It was not obvious that doing digital calculation with numbers was the best way to go, particularly for complex things. So this first era of the 30s and 40s, I would say, was when people started putting together ideas like digital computing, binary math, electronic computing, what's called the, the programmable computer, the stored program computer with software. All these ideas started coming together uh, in the 30s and 40s. In addition, there were theoretical ideas that also fit into this and helped inspire some of the understanding. And these were ideas like Alan Turing's analysis of algorithms, what can and cannot be computed, Claude Shannon's notion of information, which came out in 1948, and he found a way to mathematize the concept of information. So all these ideas came out. And by the end of the 40s, people were building the first, what we now call supercomputers. Actually, they're less powerful than this laptop I've got in front of me. But they were doing scientific supercomputing and inventing the whole concept of numerical analysis and so forth. So that was like the pioneering age when all these great ideas came out. Then there was an era which had also started in the 40s, but started to come to fruition in the 50s. This is in parallel, not, not replacing, but in parallel, the notion of interactive computing. This is where you had the idea of a computer that could respond to you in real time, even if it was just typing a key on the keyboard and having it display on the screen. That's a real-time response. But you could also type a program and run it, and it will give you the results right away. This notion is ultimately what would lead to personal computing. You know, we take it for granted that a computer can respond to you in real time. This was not an obvious idea, and it was not mainstream until well into the 60s. And so this actually led to the idea of human-computer symbiosis, which I talked about in the book, uh, which looked lighter articulated, which was that computers could do the rote routine stuff like plotting data points or calculations, and humans could do the goal setting and pattern recognition, the stuff that people are very good at. And together, you can be more than an individual. Another phase in the 60s was the creation, uh, and again, Licklider was instrumental, the creation of the ARPA community, where he started bringing together 
computer researchers in the universities who had ideas along the same lines of interactivity and so forth, and putting the other into a community so that uh, you've got students being educated in this, you've got you know, graduate students, you've got uh, technology being developed for things like artificial intelligence, for graphics, and ultimately, so to tie all these individual sites together, the notion of networking. The ARPANET came out in 69 was sort of the apotheosis of that. Following in the 70s, uh, again, it was a flowering of the ARPA community's ideas, but the evolution of the technology, remember the microchip really started to come in in the late 60s, early 70s. So you had this combination of the hardware was becoming smaller and you begin to think in terms of one computer per person. And all these ideas about interactive software and so forth were coming to fruition, a lot of it at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center Park. And what came out of all that was the personal computing environment as we still know it today, with what you see is what you get word processing, with the mouse, with you know the uh, Ethernet, with uh, laser printing, uh, bitmap printing, and so forth. All the stuff that we're familiar with today, one computer per person. That occurred in the 80s. In the 80s, that became the personal computer revolution when the microchips got uh, small enough and cheap enough that you could begin to mass produce these things. Then, of course, in the 90s, we had the internet, which had been bubbling along since the ARPANET was launched, but it really became a mass market thing in the 1990s. And then, of course, you've got... Uh, what's going on today, which is we're carrying around all these very powerful mobile devices. And simultaneously, we've got what for a while was called the Web 2.0 idea, which is that the internet is not just for stuff that people create that centralized authorities or centralized companies create for your consumption, but individuals can contribute, individuals can create, individuals can post you get, you know, the rise of social media, all of that. And we're still in the throes of that. So those are how I see the, the big phases. So to your mind, there are essentially six, seven phases, I guess, to the book. That's, a, that's about correct. I've never counted up the phases, but yeah, that's true. But don't forget, these phases are apparent only in retrospect. Sure. Uh, when you're living through it, it's all continuous. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> What turns out to be important is, isn't always obvious at the time. Let's take each decade in turn and start with, with the 40s. We would want to start at the as early as we can go, and 40 seems like a natural point to start. It pretty much seems like 40s was the time where there was a realization that analog computers may not be adequate to meet the demands. From your vantage point, how do you uh, characterize the 40s and who were the major players, people contributing at that particular point of time? Well, there were a lot of them. And as I said, I have a whole chapter about the shifts in thinking, the ideas that had to emerge in order to come together into what we call the electronic digital computer. Well, what you see when you look back at it is a lot of pioneers, hardware pioneers, each getting some of the pieces, but not all. So I had talked earlier about the analog computing. Uh, these actually, I think the first efforts to do that date back to the 20s. And the electric power grid was the problem that created it. So the neighbor Bush, he built a whole series of analog computers. He had a whole team at MIT driven by the need to solve these very hard equations. Once they had built the things, they were used for all sorts of calculations you know, like calculating the behavior of the ionosphere, things like that. They were very hard to use, but once you got them set up, they were very, they could calculate things very fast because it was a physical model. You just had to turn the crank. So the shift to digital was, as I say, at the time, it was not obvious. The MIT group during the war, they had actually already started to do this. They were starting to play, replace the mechanical rods and cams and so forth with vacuum tubes. They were doing electronic analog computers. And those were really fast, still tricky to set up, but they were really fast. So they had this whole system of analog computing. 
there were people building analog circuitry to do various types of lab calculations and so forth. The notion of digital computing that rests upon an idea, this is one of my favorite stories, so I hope you'll have patience for telling it, but in 1935 or 6, Bush needed somebody to keep his machine, it's called the differential analyzer, to keep the machine in repair and to help people set their problems up on it. He arranged a work study where the kid would work towards a master's halftime and work on the machine halftime. And he sent out a bunch of postcards you know, advertising this job and ended up hiring a kid who had, just by happenstance, seen one of these postcards posted on the bulletin board at the University of Michigan. He had finished up his uh, undergraduate degree and I believe it was engineering. Then he was looking for a job. He was thinking about going into industry. You know, what do I do? And he saw this and applied and got hired. His name was Claude Shannon. And Shannon got there and he was looking at this device and there were a bunch of motors that turn these rods and so forth. And there was a big circuit board that controlled the motors and you had to you know, close some circuits and open some circuits and they were wired in all sorts of ways. Anyway, to, to get things set up properly. And of course, these were little switches that you threw. They were electromechanical switches, little electromagnets you know, to open and shut them. And sometimes that would go bad and he had to figure out what was working. And Shannon was playing with this and he realized because he had just taken a course in symbolic logic in his senior year, he realized that opening and closing these switches in, you know, serial and parallel wiring works just like true and false in logic. This had never occurred to anybody. In retrospect, it's obvious. You could you know, take this notion, this abstract notion that, you know, an intellectual process, true, false, reasoning, implication, and so forth, and you could instantiate it in a physical system. In retrospect, it's a very profound idea. Well, I believe we talked about this last time. So he realized this, and he wrote his master's thesis on this subject. It is probably the most influential master's thesis of the 20th century. When you read it, it's it's actually very clear. He's clearly having a wonderful time showing how this analogy works, designing circuits. He designed like a, a digital lock where you had to key in a certain sequence of numbers in order to make it unlock, so forth. Embedded in this notion of switches and logic was another very profound idea that he didn't really dwell on. But when you think about it, it's pretty important, which is that not only can you do true-false, but you have a physical system that can make a decision. Because if you can do true and false, and also negation, which you wire the switch backwards, if you have true and false and negation, you can do an if-then statement. If this is true, then do that. That's a decision. So you can instantiate in a physical system the ability to decide. You know, think about that. So he did that. And, you know, the lock says, you know, if, if it's this combination, open the door. If, you know, that it's, it's all there. Also, as a little exercise in an appendix, just in passing, he showed how to, that you could use switches to do this very obscure form of mathematics that almost nobody had heard of called binary arithmetic, that you could represent numbers as open and shut, one and zero. He didn't invent binary arithmetic. It had been around, but very few people knew about it. But anyway, he showed you can do addition and subtraction and how to do it. So the, the idea that you can, you know, create, use switches. And they, by that point, the telephone system was full of these electromechanical switches, the electromagnets that force the mechanical switch to open and shut. So people started to realize that you could do digital computing with these switches. And ultimately, they realized that, well, a mechanical switch is pretty slow compared to what you'd like. They had vacuum tubes invented for the radio industry. And those could function as switches, and they could be really fast. And that was another switch that the we, we've all heard about Charles Babbage back in the 19th century and invented what could have been the first computer if he'd actually gotten the money to build it. And, of course, Ada Lovelace invented the first programs. But that was a purely mechanical computer, and it would have, it's not clear how well it would have worked, uh, just because of mechanical friction. 
But the notion that you could go from mechanical to electromechanical, you know, these circuit operated switches to vacuum tubes was another key idea. And again, it wasn't obvious. For the benefit of listeners, just how would you describe a vacuum tube and its importance to these systems? Well, some of us grew up with vacuum tubes, so we know what they look like. But uh, imagine a clear light bulb with some metal stuff in the in, inside. You turn it on and it starts to glow. And all you see when it's operating is the glow. I mean, the, it's it's got a gas on the inside that gets ionized, a bit like a neon tube. But what you don't see is that there's a current flowing from one piece of metal to another inside there through the ionized gas. Simply, there's circuits in there that just putting a small change in the, the voltage on one input, you can either turn that current on or turn it off. So it's a very, very small, very fast input. You can flip the current from on or off. Or actually, you can, uh, you can also use it as an amplifier. You can t- put a small input and get a very large you know, output. But the idea is that with through purely electronic means, you're controlling the flow of electrons, you can switch a current on and off. Yeah, th- and it looks really cool. You, you, you look inside a, one of the old fashioned radios with the vacuum tubes and you see all these things glowing in there. <laughs> uh, they're, they're really cool looking. What we've realized is, I think, pretty much the genesis of digital computing or that idea was born in the 30s and 40s. It was. It was. Anything else we would want to touch on and briefly summarize before we move to 1950s? Well, there were some important ideas. I mean, people went along and, of course, the war really accelerated this because there was money to burn and people really focused on the problems. So the first computer to really put most of all of this together was the ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania, which went online. Actually, it, they didn't quite finish it before the war was over. It went public on Valentine's Day, 1946. To be provocative, they called it an electronic computer. Now, that does not sound provocative today. At the time, it was, because in those days, computer was a job description. And they were trying to, you know, they called it an electronic brain. They were trying to emphasize that this thing was, you know, quote, thinking. And, of course, the reporters of the day ate it up. So the ENIAC, the first, that led to some of the first business machines. It led to scientific computing. At the same time, because of the involvement of one of the great mathematicians of all time, John von Neumann, He had gotten interested in the computers because of his work on the Manhattan Project. He realized that there were computations even he couldn't do in his head, that not just the bomb project, but science in general could greatly benefit from these massive computations. Von Neumann was the first to, because he was a mathematician, you know, he thought in abstractions, he first outlined sort of an abstract architecture for computers that you have a central processing unit, an arithmetic unit, and then a memory where you store data and you you shuttle the data back and forth to be processed and put it back in the memory. So we we still call it the fundamental architecture, and that's still more or less what we have today in most computers. And at the same time, he articulated, there's some debate as to who actually had the idea, but he certainly articulated very clearly the notion that the program of the computer could be abstracted into a digital form encoded as numbers and stored in the memory along with the data. And this was an absolutely crucial idea. This is the origin of what we now call software. We think of this as a natural idea, it wasn't. Because, you know, the first programmable computers, you had to run a paper tape full of holes and so forth through the thing each time you wanted to run a problem, as opposed to storing it in memory and then calling on the algorithm when you needed it. So this was an absolutely crucial idea and led to what we now call software. So that was the 40s. 
I think we really want to touch on on one additional piece, which is just understanding the backdrop of the 40s and how important World War II was as a driver and catalyst in all these activities. You certainly depict that quite well in the book, but talk a little about how World War II kind of overshadows and, and drives essentially most all of this activity. Well, it does. I mean, people had been experimenting with computing machines well before the war in the 30s, in part driven by the need to form complex calculations for engineering or for science. The guys who built the ENIAC had actually started before the war. They were interested in things like weather forecasting. But of course, the war greatly accelerated uh, that effort. What was happening during the war was not only were there urgent problems that needed to be solved, but in order to solve them, you had these projects that brought together some of the most brilliant people in the country, in the world, actually, and put them to work on very practical problems. The most famous now was the Manhattan Project, which was, of course, to make the atomic bomb. And that was just all these engineering things. But you had a brilliant young physicist like Richard Feynman was there. Freeman Dyson was working, I believe, was in England. He was working on other problems. And, of course, John von Neumann, who had already established his reputation. He was the Einstein of mathematics. I mean, he, he would revolutionize his fields for breakfast. He was just this incredible genius. He was from Hungary. And he was part of the Manhattan Project. And as I say, he realized that the, there were computations that needed to be done that just simply could not be done, uh, even with desktop calculators. You needed a machine to do it. So that's how he got into computing. But uh, there were other projects as well. Eckert and Mockley doing the ENIAC, they were calculating artillery tables for the Army. That was at the University of Pennsylvania. That was a fairly small project, but nonetheless, a very practical one. At MIT, one of the major efforts of the war, which brought together just huge numbers of people, it was called the Radiation Lab. What they were working on was radar. Radar had been invented in England at the start of the war, and of course, it was critical for defending against the Luftwaffe, but they didn't have the resources or the security to develop it. So MIT became the hotbed of that. You know, so you had all these physicists and mathematicians and so forth. Ultimately, something like 10 Nobel Prizes had their roots in the radiation lab. They invented, among other things, the microwave oven. But um, they just all of these things came out of there. And what happened is when you put these academics together, suddenly forced to grapple with real-world practical engineering problems, forced them out of their sort of mental grooves and they started to make associations and see ideas that might not have occurred for a long, long time, if ever. Von Neumann was a great example. He'd been perfectly happy as a mathematician, but he, once he saw the power of computing, he went on to more or less invent scientific computing. Norbert Wiener, a mathematician at MIT, invented cybernetics, which was extremely influential in the 40s. It tried to the ideas of feedback control, of information, of computation. That was an attempt to synthesize all that. It's since been supplanted by other things, but it was an extremely influential set of ideas. So you had many, many cases of people forced out of their mental ruts by this huge collaborative effort for the war. So it really accelerated technology, but it also created these idea factories. So again, we'll move into the 50s. We're approaching this from the lens of people, key events, and, and sort of the main ideas, those three aspects. One of the big things that happened in the 50s, well, there were parallel tracks. The kind of electronic computers that were developed with the ENIAC and its successors and the uh, scientific computers that were being developed by von Neumann at Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study, those kept going forward and they were commercialized. IBM started making 
its computers. And they were what we now call batch processing computers, that they would take a calculation, they would grind it out, they'd give you the output, and they weren't interactive at all. And for a lot of things like payroll, where you're just trying to print checks, that's what you want. IBM, you know, was becoming a powerhouse in that. But there was this parallel track grew up because of efforts to defend against the Soviet atomic threat, what was perceived to be a threat at MIT, because of course MIT had been this hotbed of computing. And MIT, one of the things that came out of the radiation lab and all the electronics expertise around there was something called Whirlwind, which was the first interactive computer. It was the first real-time computer. It started in uh, 1944, almost exactly the same time as the ENIAC. Originally, it was supposed to power a flight simulator for training pilots, but they quickly realized that the real-time computing was the thing, the responsive computing. And this would have a lot of practical you know, business applications and so forth. So they were developing that. A whirlwind was being developed. It actually occupied a house, a small house on the MIT campus. I've seen a photograph of a guy showing his girlfriend around inside the whirlwind, which was just racks of vacuum tube circuitry. But in the early 1950s, there was a crash program to develop a new computer-driven, real-time computer-driven radar system to counter what was perceived to be the Soviet threat of bombers coming over the North Pole. ICBMs didn't exist at that point yet anyway, but they were, we knew the Soviets had bombers, so we had to have these new radars. And so they developed, they used Whirlwind uh, as a prototype and developed computers based on that real-time responsive computers that could process the radar data coming in, display it onto the screen for the operator. The operator could use handheld device, it was called a light gun, it's not a mouse, but a handheld device to choose, select images on the screen for further analysis. The operator also had a keyboard and so forth. The operators, the various radar centers were linked together, telephone lines that could pass digital data from one to the next. There were 23 of these centers when they finally got it developed. It was called the SAGE project. Uh, 23 of these centers that were passing information you know, around North America over networks. And this setup with you know, the computer driving images on a screen, the operator interacting with it in real time, all connected together, that is essentially the conceptual ancestor of computing as we know it today, certainly of personal computing and the internet. As I write about in the book, the, the guy who did the human factors design for all of this, uh, he headed the team was J.C. R. Licklider, and he, from this experience, conceived the idea of, because he was really into human factors, the idea of the machines and humans working together, in this case, not to do radar and military stuff, but to you know, synthesize knowledge, to share knowledge, to plot data points and display data in humanly meaningful forms, to access knowledge, you know, and to collaborate. All of this, and that was part of his vision. That And that became, uh, I talk about, there's a lot of intellectual ferment going on around Licklider at that time, the rise of cognitive psychology, the, all of which fed into these ideas. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful time writing that section. But he eventually articulated all this in 1960 as man-computer symbiosis where he described how all this would work. He envisioned what we now call a personal computer. I mean, he had the idea of a sort of a desktop CRT, you know, that would display information on a desktop, but it was basically a one-person computer networked and uh, so forth. So a lot of the ideas that became the basis of personal computing were already articulated there. In 1962, we're oh, getting into the 60s now, just so listeners, I think, have a sense, I think in your book, you talk about Licklider as someone who is at the very forefront of psychology and certainly human factors through acoustics research as well, who sort of leaves his very promising career in psychology, I believe at Harvard, and falls in love with this idea of computing and human-computer symbiosis and sort of goes full throttle. 
Well, sort of. I mean, he went from Harvard to MIT, where he was part of Project Sage, and he continued his research, but he was also thinking in terms of the human computer symbiosis. And then towards the end of the 50s, I forget exactly which year, this new firm called Boat, Berenik, and Newman, it doesn't exist anymore, but it had started up as a kind of think tank contract research thing. It was in Cambridge. And they hired him and essentially gave him a budget to start exploring the use of computers for what he came to call human-computer symbiosis. When he wrote that article, he was already at both Brannick and Newman. Yet another spin-off of the SAGE project was a company called the Digital Equipment Corporation, which was creating compact commercial versions of Whirlwind using advanced technologies like transistors to make what they called many, well, they didn't call it many computers then, but they, interactive computers, they, they called the PDP series. So the first computer, I think may actually have been the first off the assembly line, Licklider bought for Bolt Brannick and Neumann, it was the PDP one, and they used it as interactive computing to experiment with a lot of the ideas that he was talking about, how humans can interact with the computer. He was also, by the way, very interested in what we now call digital libraries, using computers to access the knowledge. This was a part of his vision. So he actually did a lot of seminal work in you know, digital library technology. So he was there. He was experimenting with this. And he was there from about 59, 58 or 59, through about 62 when he was called to ARPA. So if we have to summarize, if the 40s were the birth of batch processing, 50s laid the groundwork for what would become real-time computers. And uh, yeah, well, uh, th those came out of the 40s also, but yes. So t talk about how then in the 60s, if we move, move to 60s, what were the core things which Licklighter would have looked at? And what was the genesis of the birth of ARPA, ARPANET? So in 1962, what was then called ARPA, now it's DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But anyway, ARPA hired him to do a program in command and control, their first computer research program. They have not looked at computers before. And ARPA was, had been created uh, in the aftermath of Sputnik to to really do advanced research for the Pentagon. So Licklider realized that real-time computing, human computer symbiosis was central to co the command and control problem. So he quite legitimately, and he told his bosses that, he said, okay, I've been given $10 million a year to realize my vision. And he knew all the people around the country who were researching ideas in this realm, and he started funding them. There were a number of things he wanted to fund. He funded the artificial intelligence research and advanced computer research at Carnegie Mellon University. If Carnegie Mellon is a powerhouse of computing today, it's because Licklider funded so there because they were not at the time. So artificial intelligence research was part of it. Uh, graphics research, being able to display rich graphics on the screen, that was a big part of it. In order to get responsive computers to the masses, remember, there, we didn't have the microchip yet. The only way they could think of to do it was something called time sharing, which is where you'd have a big central computer with terminals tapping in by telephone lines. The central computer would slice its attention amongst all the terminals very, very fast, You know, execute a few commands for each one around and around. I, I compare it to a kindergarten teacher carrying on simultaneous conversations with about 15 five-year-olds. The idea is you, uh, it would just do it so fast that it looked like it was continually responsive. So he funded a major project at MIT. Uh, they called it Project MAC. And MAC stood for either machine-aided cognition or man and computer, depending on you know your preference. They also did a lot of AI research there. Uh, people like Marvin Minsky were part of it. So Project Mac did that, and they got this up and running very quickly. People had terminals in their offices and even in their homes. 
and they were experimenting with it. They realized almost instantly that if they're all tied into a central computer, they could leave messages for each other. In fact, the first emails were sent in 1965. They didn't call it email, but that's what they were. They even had hackers trying to hack in there, playing tricks on each other. They were doing all sorts of things. They were creating computer languages. One they were working on was called Multix, which became the ancestor of Unix, which is the ancestor of Linux, which is the ancestor of Android. Before. So that all has a direct line back to Project Mac. It was just this incredible seminal idea. And when you think about it, that's more or less what we do now with the internet. A lot of the computing gets carried out in the cloud. That's cloud computing. I mean, it's sure. implemented differently, but it's a, the essential idea is the same. Those are some of the key components. And then, of course, to tie all these research groups together, Licklider realized, uh, as he had realized back from the Project Sage days, remember those radar centers were tied together with phone lines. He imagined all these uh, centers tied together with phone lines. And the famous memo, he wrote it, it was uh, April 1963. He had commissioned all these groups, some of the most famous names in computing are on this uh, distribution list. He wrote a memo called To the Members and Affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. And it's clear from that the context and the way he starts the memo that he's talking about the people, not the wires. But what he talks about in the memo are the wires. How do we get everybody working together so we don't have a Tower of Babel effect, so that our programs work with each other and so forth? And he outlined that. Now, the technology in 1963 was not up to the task of networking, but... A few years later, not Licklider, but one of his acolytes and one of his successors in that office, Robert Taylor, did commit the office to the networking. They planned and they launched it. They worked out how to do what's now called packet switching, you know, send packets of data in a way that you know, could be recovered uh, and it would survive you know, breaks in the uh, wires and so forth. And that went online in September starting in September 1969 as the ARPANET. The uh, first node was at UCLA in September, I think September 1st, 1969. The bit started to flow and they haven't stopped flowing since. Essentially, the major part of his vision, which which Licklider wrote in 1959, began to get realized in the 1960s, by the end of 1960s. That's right, yes. Yeah. And... Uh, you did mention one thing about Sputnik, how and he getting $10 million. Could you talk more about why was he given this free check? Like that's a lot of money at that particular point. Uh, well, it was, uh, it was $10 million a year. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact historical sequence, but the military, of course, always has an interest in command and control, being able to communicate you know, commander's intent to the troops or the planes is keeping track of what's happening called command and control in the military and they could begin to see that computers real-time computing was going to be essential they had only the vaguest idea and also they knew that computers were increasing importance so the military needed some insight into that so they hired Licklider to do this and even in 1962 10 million a year was pocket change for the Pentagon so it was a very handsome amount of money, but it was, you know, not super extravagant by their standards. This is pretty interesting. And then by the end of 1960s, it seems like there is computers talking to each other. Talk about how they were even able to demo the interactivity of the computer. Remember, for most people, even in the ARPA community, even the ones being funded by ARPA, a lot of it, they were still thinking in terms of the old-fashioned batch processing type of computer or terminal with the, sort of the uh, green letters on a black screen, you know, just for the old-fashioned type of terminals, or even teletype. But one of the people that Licklider funded uh, was this sort of weird, lonely guy who was at Stanford Research Institute in uh, Menlo Park. It's now SRI International. And his name was Douglas Engelbart. He had, through his own personal history, come up with a very similar idea to Licklider's man-computer symbiosis. You know, using computers to enhance 
human ability. And he had had all these ideas, but he couldn't get anybody to listen to him, in part because in those days, the Bay Area was this absolute desert of computer expertise. I mean, nobody knew beings about computing. People were starting to do things with you know, transistors and so forth. Uh, one of the transistor pioneers, Shockley, had gone out to Stanford. And, you know, ideas were percolating, but basically, you know, the, the, the center of gravity of computing was MIT and what later became Route 128, all of that. So when Licklider started his efforts, uh, Ingebart showed up asking for money. Uh, he couldn't get his bosses at SRI to understand what he was getting at. It was just it was awful. But anyway, so Licklider funded Ingebart. He got, he had got enough money to hire some really first class engineers, including one Bill English, who was a genius at turning Ingelbart's often very fuzzy ideas into actual hardware. And they started working on how to make computers more interactive. They were just doing all these things. And in 1968, I forget which month it was. It was before the real Woodstock, but it's the Woodstock of computing. There was a big meeting. You know, of computer types in, I believe, San Francisco. Engelbart was going to give a demonstration and they had this enormous screen, which had this, what now seems a very kludgy way of projecting his image. But there was this enormous image of him behind Engelbart and he's standing up there on stage and a white shirt and a thin black tie with like a NASA launch controller. And he's got this enormous headset with uh, earphones and a mic on, and they were tied into the actual computers, which were down in Menlo Park, which is quite a distance away. Anyway, so he is displaying what they had accomplished. So he shows the screen, and he shows there's this pointer he could move around with this little device. He called it a mouse, which they had invented. He showed that they could have a screen with bitmap graphics, some of the text you could click on it with the mouse, you know, the pointer of the mouse, and it would jump to another screen. They had hypertext. I don't know if they called it that, but they had hypertext. He showed a word processing program that was what you see is what you get, and that you could do deletions and insertions, and you could type, and it would show. It was like word processing and all of this stuff. And, of course, it's, it's network because they were talking to the computers down uh, it, the whole thing could have crashed at any minute. Uh, Engelbart said later, and I did get the pleasure of interviewing him about this. He said the whole time he was hearing in his, what he was hearing in his earphones were panicked responses from people said, Oh, we lost this. We lost. Oh my God. We'll try to get this working. And he was fully expecting the whole thing to crash, but it didn't. I also talked to people who were in the audience and it was showing what now seems like modern computing, the standard desktop computing, people are out there looking at it and says, what the hell did we just see? A lot of them didn't, they didn't automatically grasp that this was the future. They thought it was just something really weird. And it was only later for the ideas were picked up in the seventies and developed. And actually they didn't really become commercial to the world until the Macintosh in 1984. You know, those ideas were there and the technology had been worked out. Ideas by Engelbart and instantiated by Bill English and company. That is pretty fascinating to come to yeah. think about it. There are two things which are clear takeaways, right? The first is this demonstration of what a c computer could become. But right. secondly, how do you launch products? Like th that is another thing which you feel like it's a mainstream thing today where people go to a stage and Jobs has done it many times and m many other CEOs who do it today. But it feels like that was the seminal moment where it was done for the first time. Well, the ideas were there, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Turning that into a product that you can mass produce and that individuals or companies can actually afford is critical. and. Part of that, it, it's not simply having the product and saying, here it is, guys, use it. The customers have to have an appreciation of what they can use it for. Remember, when Engelbart gave his presentation, 
he and his team have been working with this and using it and they appreciated it. But uh, even some of the ARPA folks didn't, and the audience didn't understand the significance of what they were seeing. This is not obvious. And it took quite a long time all through the 70s and what we now look back on as you know the hobbyist personal computer revolution with the Apple II and so forth, just to get the idea that you could, an individual could even have a computer, a responsive computer, and use it for something useful. And then, of course, with the Macintosh, you could actually you know, start to see things graphically and manipulate it uh, in ways that we now find familiar. That took a long time for that to percolate, for people to actually understand how they could use a computer. So I think it could be helpful to kind of crystallize the 60s in terms of its moment in time. So this is really where Licklider has started to formulate his vision for what it means to unite computers and human beings, but also creating this connective tissue between computers. And that's really the, um, the birth of the intergalactic network. You know, ARPANET is, is starting to form and, and gain momentum. So uh, leading into the 70s, how would you characterize the 70s in that context? Well, at, at least from the perspective of computing, the way I think of the 60s is that there was this ferment of ideas that had been boiling up already. Licklider helped to forge people who were coming up with these ideas. He helped to forge a community, but it was still a, a lot of ideas. And the question, there, there's still the question which you raised earlier, of how do you actually turn this into a, something that people can use that is that is a product, that is a, a, a utility, something that is tangible? How do you put all the pieces together? And the way that happened for personal computing was through uh, the efforts of the Xerox Corporation, which in 1970 decided they could see that Computing and you know, everything around it was going to be critical for the office of the future. They were flush with cash. They'd spent the decade putting Xerox machines into every office in the world. They were the Apple computer of the 60s. So they decided to open up a research center to basically invent the office of the future and to do a lot of advanced research for the Xerox Corporation. They actually had a research center in Rochester, New York, but this was to be their computing area. So they did, and it opened up in 1970. It was called Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, P-A-R-C, Park. They had several sections looking at various types of things. But for the computer work, they hired Robert Taylor, who I mentioned earlier, who was actually also trained in psychology. He had been one of Licklider's successors at ARPA. He had run the office for a couple of years. It was Taylor who had started the ARPANET project, which was brought to fruition under his successor. So they hired Robert Taylor to basically put together the group that would you know, do this computer-driven office of the future. And Taylor proceeded to hire the cream of the ARPA community. So he hired all these young people who had been working on various aspects of interactive symbiotic computing, time sharing, the networking, you know, the hardware, the software, all of it. He didn't hire Engelbart himself, but he hired Bill English and a lot of the Engelbart team who were, you know, they were just a few miles away. He hired people to work on hardware. He hired a fellow from MIT who had helped install the ARPANET there, uh, Bob Metcalf. And Metcalf started to do local, what we now call local area networking. So basically, in the space of about four years, they took all these ARPA ideas and melded them together. Not just a gadget, not just a personal computer, but a whole ecosystem of the hardware, the first bitmapped personal computer, uh, single desk. It would you know, not, look, not look too out of place today. It uh, had black letters and a white screen. 
the actual computer itself sat under your desk. It looks like a power computer now. It ran a WYSIWYG word processor. It's the ancestor of Microsoft Word. It used a mouse as developed by the former Engelbart team. They connected all the machines together with Ethernet, which was invented by Bob Metcalf in order to connect all the computers in an office so they could trade data. If you wanted to print something out, you send it to a laser printer, which they invented. Basically, it was a Xerox machine with markings done by laser instead of by imaging. They had this complete ecosystem. It, it was just very close to the, the modern concept of desktop computing. It even had you know, Alan Kay was there, and you know, Alan was this crazy guy. He was envisioning what we now call a laptop that every kid would you know carry around, and he called it the Dynabook, you uh, know, be part of education and so forth. I think that idea has been more or less superseded by smartphones, but hey. You know, the ideas were all there, and they had put it together. And what enabled it to happen was that they had, partly it was the technology of the ARPANET, which they could adapt for Ethernet. Partly it was that finally microchips were coming along. They were still very expensive, but you know, Xerox could afford to build these things with the assumption that prices would come down and make these things affordable. They created this environment, and they did their best to market it. Their target was the Fortune 500 companies. It's not like they didn't know about the hobbyist personal computer work going on. Remember, the Homebrew Computer Club, which famously gave rise to the Apple II and all that, they were meeting a mile and a half away at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. You could practically see Park from Slack. They're right there together. And a lot of the park people actually went to those hobbyist meetings. So they knew exactly what was happening. They thought they had such a wonderful system, such a very capable system, that they never took the hobbyist computers seriously. So the question is always, why didn't Xerox become the dominant force in personal computing? It's because they were selling a high-end system, figuring they would sell it to the high-end customers. And then as production ramped up, things would get cheaper, which is not crazy. It's just that's not how things worked out. But the ideas came together. And as it happens, the hobbyist computers became the delivery mechanism. And you know, that strain of things became the delivery mechanism for people. They went from the these very primitive hobbyist computers to getting much more sophisticated machines as opposed to Xerox's vision of from the top down. You know, the basic ideas were just there. They were in the air. And that, that's how the 70s gave rise to the idea of what we now call personal computing. So George Paik, he's running Xerox Park, right? He hires... Yeah, uh, George Paik was a physicist who had been hired to put together Xerox Park. That's right. And so Park develops into this sort of intellectual heart, I guess, of the computing movement. Is that fair to say? Well, well, there was still a lot going on in Cambridge. Remember, Route 128 was still a major force. But in terms of what we now call personal computing, in terms of the ideas of putting all the pieces together, Park was for a time in the early to mid-70s, even to, into late 70s, that was the cutting edge. And there was a lot going on in Boston, too, in the Boston area. So what happens to ARPANET? In the 70s. It continues to expand. They kept the first four nodes were completed by December 69. UCLA was the first. Uh, I know the University of Utah was one. SRI, the Engelbart's group, was another. And I forget where the fourth one was. They had the four up and running. And from there, they could see that it was working. They started to expand elsewhere. They brought MIT on fairly quickly, Carnegie Mellon, you know, all the places that were funded by ARPA. Eventually, they had nodes on the network. By that point, it was nationwide. They started to uh, loop in some military bases. It was mainly, though, for the research community. So that evolved, and at the same time, the software itself was evolving. This is actually very important for the later development of the Internet. 
one of the guys who had helped create the ARPANET, especially the software design, was Robert Kahn. And he was, by that point, was at ARPA. He was running the computer office there. ARPA wanted to start looping in not just fixed sites that were on landlines, but they wanted to be able to do networking through radio to mobile units, you know, jeeps, tanks, so forth. They wanted to do satellite to get to ships or across the Atlantic, across the ocean. Doing networking through radio or through satellites, the, the environment is physically very different. So you couldn't just use the same software. You use the same ideas about packet switching, but doing these sort of bursts of bits that you then reassembled on the far side, but you had to do it differently with different data rates and so forth. So Khan had the idea that says what we need is a way that we can make all of these networks work together so that when I send a message, it's transparent. Uh, it doesn't care about, yeah, I don't have to worry about how it gets there, but bits just flow across these different networks. And so he went to a fellow who was then at Stanford and was at Surf. Surf had been a graduate student at UCLA, uh, helped launch the first software and get the first node installed. And he basically said to Surf, I want you to figure out a way, a protocol that we can get all these networks to talk to each other. And what they came up with was it has a dreadfully technical name. It's called TCP IP. The idea was that you would encode the packets in a way that it would run through your network. And then if you need to transfer to another network, say a radio network, you'd go through a gateway. It would then be repackaged for the radio network, automatically repackaged. And if then it had to go to a satellite, be repackaged for that. And if then it comes back to the landline, be repackaged again. So it's just utterly transparent and the bits would automatically flow. All you had to do was speak. Each node, uh, each gateway had to speak TCP IP, and then the bits would flow. The significance of TCP IP, it was both a technical innovation and it was like a profound sociological revolution at the same time because you didn't need to know how the network worked on the other side. TCP IP would take care of that. It just had to go through the gateway. So long as you... Everybody used TCIP. You could hook in another kind of network that hadn't even been thought of yet. You could hook it in and speak the protocol and you know, the bits will flow. That is how the internet, and by the way, the internet is basically a set of all networks that speak TCPIP. The internet was able to grow exponentially to zillions of networks all across the world without anybody in charge because they devised this protocol. It was transparent. That's why I said it's a sociological revolution. So long as you speak the right protocol and agree to abide by those rules, the bits would flow. So to then summarize and wrap up for between the 60s and the 70s, if 60s were the birth of interactive computing, right. be it time-shared, Yes. 70s really demonstrated that that computer could be personalized and used by individuals. It's where the ideas really came together, came together and implemented in a way that was practical and usable by non-experts. And at the same time, the networking, the ARPANET, was growing into the internet with this, this this additional protocol with TCPIP that allowed the networks to start hooking together and growing again without you didn't have to know how you know six networks down the line something was configured in order to get your message through. So this is where the ideas that had been come bubbling up through the 40s, 50s, 60s really started to coalesce into a set of ideas. TCPIP actually went live, I think, in 83. So you can date the birth of the Internet to 83. And, and then there's this whole story, which we talked about last time, about how it went into the commercial realm. But by the time the 80s get here, the basic set of ideas had really 
began to crystallize. And then the 80s are when they start to become affordable and start get, getting out into the hands of individuals everywhere. It really starts to become personal. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.